Okay, good evening, everyone. A friend of mine told me a number of years ago that there was a rabbi in uh, Washington, D.C., who, uh, on Yom Kippur, called Nidre Knight, he gave a magnificent sermon. And in the audience, there happened to be uh, one of the top producers of the news networks in America. I think it was NBC or something like that. So after the, uh, the uh, Kol Nidre uh, Drusha, uh, the producer was very, very impressed. And he was like, he said to him, it was just an amazing speech. He said, but do you think you could cut it down to about 15 minutes? So he said to him, so, oh, and the wheel started turning. He says, oh, the nightly news, I'll be on television. He said, yeah, I think I might be able to cut it down to 15 minutes. And then he said, well, do you think you could cut it down to 10 or maybe 5? He says, oh, that's going to be difficult. But yeah, I think I can do it. He said, so why didn't you? <laughs> uh, I don't believe there are any producers here this evening, right? So uh, I might take a little bit longer than the uh, five or ten minutes. Um, in many respects, the night of Shavuos, which is almost upon us, is the most elevated and exalted night of the entire year. Uh, it is brought in the name of the Arizal, that whatever we can attain, whatever we can achieve in spiritual growth, we can achieve it as a result of what's taking place on Shavuos night. The Torah, when it speaks about the Yomim Tovim, so it has a special name for Yomim Tovim. The name is Moadim. Moed. Moed, the word Moed is the same as the same Shoresh as the word Ya'ad, destiny. Because the Moadim are that which are bringing us to our destiny. The Moadim are the vehicles by which we can travel to attain what the Almighty originally wanted. And it's a time, the same word Moed, has the meaning of meeting. Is it possible that two people can walk together if they haven't met? So the concept of Moed is meeting. And on the Moadim, we have an encounter with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Every single one of us on the Moed has an opportunity to have an encounter with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And we can thereby move to, towards our destiny. And that's why it's called, by the way, Regolim as well, because it's movement towards. We're moving to somewhere. The Yom Tif is not, my Rebbe, Zechariah Levracha, Rafutna used to say, a Jew should never say that another Yom Tif has passed. But rather, a Jew has to say that I have acquired another Yom Tif. The Yom Tif is supposed to be the mechanism by which I can reach what the ultimate destiny of Klal Yisrael is. Now, there's a superficial sense of time that people normally have, and that time continues from a past long gone, and it continues to flow to a future that we can't see and we can't even anticipate. That's time. Time is flowing. It's moving. It keeps on going. My grandfather, Zechariah Levracha, used to always say, he said it in Yiddish, but I'll say it uh, in English. My grandfather used to say, he says, I don't mind that time is flying, he says, but why does it have to schlep me along with it? You know, the, that's the sense that we have in terms of time. So time is not just this flow, but rather uh, Rav Hirsch Brode, who was the son-in-law of the altar from Kelim, who was also a nephew, and he said that we have to understand that we're travelers through time. That our relationship with time is that we are going through time. And when every year, when an event comes around that took place thousands of years ago, it's not an anniversary that we're celebrating, but rather what we're reliving and we have the ability to plug into the aura, plug into the energy, plug into the accomplishments that the miracles that originally established the Yom Tov, we can experience that when we come to this date in, the, in time. 
It brings us step by step, every Yom Tif, one step closer to our destiny. And if that's the case, well, we have to make sure that we take advantage of what the Yom Tif has to offer. I tell over a story about a fellow who was traveling by train and he had to get to Minsk. And uh, he wanted to make sure that he got to Minsk. He says, listen, I want to go to Minsk, but I don't want to go to Pinsk. So you make sure I'm very, very tired that when I get to Minsk, you'll wake me up and you'll, uh, you'll get me off the train so that I can be in Minsk where I have to be. So he goes to sleep, of course. And sure enough, when the train stops, he looks out the window and what does he see? Pinsk, not Minsk. He says, wait a minute, I got all excited, very angry at the uh, conductor. He started yelling at him, screaming at him, how could you do this to me? I told you I need to be in Minsk and not in Pinsk. And here I am in Pinsk. And the guy's standing there stoic. He doesn't make any movement, nothing. Doesn't affect him, all his yelling and screaming. He says, Don't, what's the matter with you? Don't you understand what I did? He says, sure I understand. But it comes to nothing compared to what the guy I threw off in Minsk did to me. <laughs> Our job is to make sure not to sleep through the station. We're traveling, and these Yomim Tovim are stations in time. And we have to make sure not to sleep through the station. So, Shavuos is man, Matan Torah Sein. It was the time the Torah was given to Klal Yisrael. On Shavuos, we received the Torah, and we had a face-to-face -face encounter with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And while we were there, while we stood at the foot of the mountain, from Rosh Chodesh Sivan on, Moshe Rabbeinu tells us that the whole process from leaving Mitzrayim was to get to this point in time and that we had to prepare for that moment when HaKadosh Baruch Hu would give us the Torah. So just as Klal Yisrael had to prepare as they were leaving Mitzrayim and they were coming closer to Maimed Har Sinai, we too have to prepare. We have to get ready. You can't just fall into the Yontif. Somehow, our avoda on the night of Shavuos is to complete the preparation that we've put in up until this point. However, we have a problem. Because in reality, we're faced with a very complicated and perplexing dilemma. Because you see, on the one hand, we're living in the best of times. The best of times to be Jewish. Probably the best time to be Jewish since the Churban Abayis. We're living in that period of time today where people can live their lives as true Jews without too much distraction, without too much persecution and so on. We're free of the persecution. And in most countries, in most countries, Jews are free to live their lives and acquire everything that they possibly could want, both spiritually and materially. It's an amazing time. It's a wonderful time to be Jewish. But on the other hand, we're living in one of the worst times in the world to be Jewish. And the very essence of what it means to be Jews is being challenged. I say we're living in the best of times. What's the best of times? What does it mean? Well, I'll tell you what. The best of times means that there are more people learning Torah today than there were before the war, or perhaps in any other time since the Korban. The day schools are proliferating. Yeshiva Gedolos are opening every other day. Yeshiva Ketanos. Throughout the entire world, people are studying Torah. Seminaries for women are mushrooming. Every other week, there's another seminary opening up. Dafyomi. How many thousands of Jews are studying Dafyomi that never, ever happened before? And formal and informal study groups are constantly taking place. You know, all kinds of kolalim. There are kolalim in the daytime, kolalim in the nighttime. There's an Arab Shabbos kolal. The kolalim are, again, sprouting forth. And there are so many programs designed to help people learn Torah and encourage both young and old. Avos and Bani, fathers and sons and children are studying constantly. It's amazing the kind of 
growth there is in Limud HaTayra. It's a Nes Nigla. We realize that for a moment that this is a miracle, an open miracle. Let me ask you a question. Imagine if all the databases of all the, or most, of the great universities, the databases were totally wiped out. And most of the professors were killed. And many of the students were executed. How long do you think Harvard, Yale, Princeton, the Sorbonne, Oxford, Cambridge, all of these great universities, how long do you think it would take to reconstruct that information? How many hundreds of years? Hundreds and hundreds of years to reconstruct all of that information that went down as a result of destroying the databases. Now, isn't this what happened to the Jewish people? A mere 60 years ago, 70 years ago, all the yeshivas in Europe were destroyed. Most of the rabbeim were murdered. Certainly the talmidim were destroyed. Certainly the talmidim stopped learning. People, when they came to America after the war, they thought, that's it, it's all over. It's not going to be possible to rebuild. And here we are today, when we take a look and we see how much Torah is being learned and how much this information has been increasing constantly. And what about the Balchuva movement? This wonderful, beautiful Balchuva movement. Well, years ago, there was the, the word Balchuba wasn't even in existence. So many organizations, so many individuals have dedicated their lives to reach out to the unaffiliated. What a time! What a beautiful time! And even those not only are not affiliated, but even those who are anti and are angry, we can reach out to them too for them to see the beauty and the truth, the wonder of Torah and Yiddishkeit. A famous story about a fellow who was studying in uh, Orsameach, uh, he and a fellow, another fellow, went to visit one of the big uh, rabbeim in, the, uh, in, in Gula. This was a number of years ago. It was in the early years. And this fellow was studying. It wasn't about Shuvah. So when they came to, the, uh, to meet the Rebbe, and the Rebbe asked him, where are you learning? So the first one who was about Shuvah, he said, I'm learning in, in Orsameach, and it's a great experience, and it's wonderful. And he says, and you? He says, I'm learning in Osamech too, but I'm not about tshuva. So the Rebbe said to him, excuse me, and why not? And why not? You think about tshuva is only for the people sitting in Dizengoff Square. It's for us. It's for us. Translation of Hebrew texts. Think about it. How much is available in English and in French and in Spanish and in Swahili? I don't, that's special for you in South Africa. But it's in every language. Every language you have so many wonderful svarim. Sixty years ago, such a thing wasn't possible. They didn't have it. And as a result of that, all this wonderful wisdom wasn't available to, to, to the common person. Unless you had a yeshiva background or a Tay school background, you couldn't, the language, you couldn't deal with the language. Today also, even with the translations, it's difficult. But imagine what it was like when there was no translations available. And believe me, as dangerous and horrible as many of the things on the internet is for us, you have to know that it's, the internet has proven to be a fantastic tool to reach out to the unaffiliated, to give them shiurim, to give them information, to expose secular Jews to Yiddishkeit. So this is an amazing time. And don't think for a moment, when you think about it, to be a Shomer Shabbos. You know what it is today to be a Shomer Shabbos? It's easy. But years ago, we lost some of our brightest young people because their parents couldn't hold down a job and even for Shabbos, and they were immediately fired, right? I know of people who had 52 jobs a year. They would go to work on Sunday and they couldn't, uh, and Friday they were let go because they weren't coming in on Shabbos. Now what happened to their kids? So there were some people who were most nefesh for Shabbos. 
So where are their kids? Like, we lost their kids. That's the whole lost generation in America. And they asked for Moshe Feinstein. They said to him, why is it these men and women were most nefesh for keeping Shabbos and their kids are lost? He said, I'll explain it to you. Because when they came home, after being fired for the tenth time that year, they'd come back and they'd sit down and they'd say, Oy! Oh, how tough it is to be Jewish. You think the kids want to be part of that? They didn't understand it. And it was tough. And who wanted to be part of something tough? They didn't want it. And that's why we lost them. Today, we're so fortunate. We have an opportunity to work at any job, at any vocation that we desire and still remain in Shomer Shabbos. So observant Jews are prominent in every single field of endeavor, academic, professional, business, and even an Orthodox Shomer Shabbos Jew yeah, was nominated to be the Vice President of the United States of America. Unheard of. What a wonderful time. And we're organized. Oh, are we organized. We have all kinds of organizations to help us with religious life. We have Hatzola, we have Zaka, we have all these wonderful chesed organizations. You know, Gemachim. You know what a Gemach is, yeah? Wonderful. Where would we be today without a Gemach? We have Gemachim for everything, from screwdrivers to, to pacifiers to dummies. I mean, you got it all. Open up the phone book in Bnei Brak. You know what you'll find? 24 pages full of Gemachim. What a wonderful people we are. And chesed organizations to help people, to provide financial help, educational direction, medical advice, family counseling and support. All of this is happening in the world today, Jewishly, religiously. And kashras? <laughs> you can go anywhere today and find kosher food. I mean, you know, they have kosher safaris in Africa. They have uh, cruises that take you to Alaska. It's all kosher, from sushi to pizza, whatever you want. It's all there. I once said that, you know, it's very easy. They've kosherized the world. But now what about the Rabbi Nishalaylam? Now what about the Rabbi Nishalaylam? My friends, we're in the worst time possible to be a Jew. We're living through some very, very difficult times. There is more assimilation today than there was almost in any other time in our history. Intermarriage in the United States is rampant. The latest Pew study puts the figure that over 61% of Jews are intermarrying in the United States of America. And that's up from 43% in the 90s and 17% in the 70s. 61%. And in some cities, like Denver, Colorado, it's 90%. According to, in Europe, to the Rabbinical Council Center of Europe, 80% of European Jews assimilate and intermarry. And 85% don't even go to a, ever go into a shul. They have no affiliation whatsoever with the Jewish community. We lost more Jews to assimilation and intermarriage since the Holocaust than we did during the Holocaust. Rabbi Lau, the mayor, you saw Mayor Lau, the former chief rabbi, the father of the current chief rabbi of Israel. In, in 2001, he was speaking in the United States, and he said like this, of the approximately 6 million Jews in the United States, about two-thirds or 4 million do not identify themselves as Jews or maintain affiliation in a synagogue. In the 56 years since the end of World War II, the Jewish population of the United States has remained pretty much static, at six million, but had intermarriage and not overtaken that community, there would now be 36 million Jews in the United States of America, a net loss of 30 million Jews. That's five times more than were killed in the Holocaust. We lost intermarriage. And we know the problems with drug abuse. We're using, losing our young people. We've lost the ability to communicate with them. The morals and values of society have, have plummeted astronomically. And the Jewish community isn't far behind. So many of our Jewish young people, students, are caught up in all these 
horrible organizations like BDS and J Street. They're only there to delegitimize Israel, which is, which is the connection that every Jew has in his heart to this land. When these things are happening, the Rabbani Shalom is talking to each and every one of us. So, that being the case, if this is our state, if this is the state of the Jewish nation today, here in Israel and Chutzlars, how are we going to prepare for Shavuos? How do we overcome this and be able to, to, to somehow absorb the beauty and the wonder and the ruchnius when all of this negativity is around us? You know, every Jew, no matter where he, where he may be, feels the pain of every single man, woman, and child who was murdered just because he was Jewish. And the way the nations of the world deal with us, the lies that they perpetrate, uh, it defies logic. We know that. It doesn't make any sense. Yet we assume business as usual. No major changes are taking place, not personally and not nationally. And if we do care, and if it really bothers us, why aren't we changing? Why isn't there something happening? Why don't we see something within the community and within ourselves? Somehow, we're not grasping the message that HaKadosh Baruch Hu was trying to communicate to us. I remember after 9-11, so a Rebbe of mine said, he said an amazing thing. During the Intifada, where thousands of Jews were, were either murdered or, or, or were hurt so terribly, um, he said, you know, uh, the world was thinking that, oh, that's happening in Israel. Hashem is speaking in Lashon HaKodesh. He said, after 9-11, now Hashem is speaking in English. So why aren't we listening? We understand what's happening. Why aren't we listening? Why don't we hear the message? Well, I would like to posit that we only hear what we want to hear. And we disregard the rest. A man hears what he wants to hear and he disregards the rest. Our ears may hear, but it doesn't enter into our awareness and we don't take it into our very being, into the essence of our soul. You know, Chazal tell us that when HaKadosh Baruch Hu was prepared to offer the Torah to Klai Yisrael, he went to all the nations of the world and he offered them the Torah. And I always thought to myself, you know, something isn't right. Because when he went to Yishmoel and he said, Maxi Bey, they said, what's written in your Torah? So God said, you can't be, you're, you're, uh, adultery is prohibited. Prohibit? Oh, no, says Yishmoel, no, no, that's not for me. I can't live with it. I mean, I had, th this, is, this is who I am. He went to Esau. And Esau said, Maxi Bey, and they were the prototype of all the nations. What's written in the Torah? And Esau said, the, the Chazal say that Hashem said, Lo uh, can't murder. He says, I can't do this without murder. I mean, you know, to the, uh, <laughs> the greatest soldier, the greatest killer is the greatest hero in the world. Always was. He says, I can't live with it. So I thought to myself, you know, that's pretty unfair. That's very unfair. It's not nice. Why did Hashem tell them, they asked, what's in your Torah? So the one thing he told them was, the one thing he knew they couldn't fulfill why didn't you tell them all the beautiful things? Tell them about Shabbos, about Cholent, Kishke, you know, all the good stuff. The family together, a good Yerushalmi cook. I mean, give them, give them something positive also. Talk about the family, the values. Oh, no, no. The one thing he told them was the one thing he knew they wouldn't be able to accept. You know, <laughs> I remember... Many years ago, I was giving a, a lecture on Tu Bishvat. And on Tu Bishvat, you talk about potential and growth and all these very nice things. And all of a sudden, a guy in the back raises his hand and says, Rabbi, can I ask a question? I said, sure. And he says to me, according to what you're saying, how do you explain the Holocaust? <coughs> now, you know, uh, <laughs> nothing to do with what I was talking about, right? So I told him it's a very good question, and it's amazing. You know what? Why don't we discuss it after the lecture, right? Or once a lady came over to me uh, in the middle of a Hanukkah lecture where I was talking about, you know, Hanukkah and, and, and all the, the, uh, the, the wonder of Torah Shabbat Peh and all the great things that we accomplished on Hanukkah. And she said, Rabbi, I can ask you. Yes. 
She raises her hand and she says, tell me, why is it that every morning a man makes a bracha, shaloh asani isha? Thank you, God, for not making me a woman. I mean, what did that have to do with Hanukkah, right? But the answer is, of course, a man hears what they want to hear and they disregard the rest. That poor man was a Holocaust survivor and that's all he had on his mind. He saw me standing there. He thought about his brother Chatzko and his brother Shmuel and his sister Yente and so on. This lady, Nebach, did she have a life. She had such a miserable life. A husband that was driving her crazy. So she says, why do we make a bracha shalom sani I said, maybe that was the reason. But anyway, the, the point is that people hear what they want to hear and they disregard the, re the rest. What if when Hashem offered the Torah to the Jews, instead of saying Nasev and Ishma, we said Maxiv Bey, what's written in your Torah? Imagine if Hashem answered us, well, you can't have an all-cash, no-tax business in the basement, I don't know, in Borough Park or Stamford Hill or something like that. The whole world would have been different. He didn't do that to us. We said Nasev and Nishma. So the answer to all this is that HaKadosh Baruch who told them all the wonderful things about Torah. He told them what it means to be a Jew. He told them about the beauty. But the only thing they heard was Lo Sitzach. The only thing they heard was Lo Sinaf and Lo Signal. That's what they heard, because a man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest. Now let's go back to Kabbalah Satora and see how this all fits into our avoda, to what we need to do. Since the second day of Pesach, we've been counting, day after day after day after day. We've been counting the days till Kabbalah Satora, till we received the Torah. We've been counting the days until we had Gilu Yishchina, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu revealed himself to us. Before he gave the Aseris Hadibros, before he revealed himself, he told Moshe Rabbeinu to whom he wants to give the Torah. What is the character? What does such a person look like that's ready to receive the Torah? Moshe Olo El Elohim. Moshe went up on the mountain. Vayikra Hashem Elov. And Hashem called him to him in a har lemor. This is what you should tell them. You saw what I did. You experienced it. I carried you on the wings of eagles. And I brought you to me. Now, if you'll listen to my voice, and you'll keep my covenant, hear my voice, you know what you'll be? This is the people. The first thing that HaKadosh Baruch Hu says is, Ato im tishma, im shamoa tishma bekoli. Listen to my voice. It doesn't say do my mitzvahs. It doesn't say tishmu el mitzvosai. It says tishmu es koili. What does that mean? Our hearts have to hear in the transmission of Torah what it is Hashem wants from us. We have to hear the call, not the words. We have to hear, you know what a call is? A call is the sound of a voice. When someone yells, help, he doesn't have to say much. You know that when he's saying, or if he says, help, it's a different story altogether. Hear the call. When Avram was told to listen to Sora, to throw Yishmoel out of their home to protect Yitzchak, what does he say? Kol asher tomar elecha Sora, shma bekola. Listen to her. Listen, listen to what's behind her. Listen to the sounds. What is she really saying? Chazal tell us, it's a Gemara in Sanhedrin. That Ruach HaKodesh disappeared. Even so, there's such a thing as a basko. Now, what is a baskol? So Toysus, on the spot, you know what he says a baskol is? A baskol is a kolo de hadra, like an echo. An echo, somebody's talking out there, and we hear it over here, it's an echo. What is this echo? It says Reb Tzodek HaKohen, such a beautiful thing. You know what the echo is? You're walking down the street, you hear two people talking, that has nothing to do with you. Nothing! You don't even know them. And they say one word, and that triggers something in your head. Oy vey. Ta-da. No. HaKadosh Baruch is talking to you. That's a basko. When it relates to you, when somehow it touches you, 
what somebody else has said in such, really not even talking to you. But it's an echo. Give you, I'll tell you a beautiful story. There were two brothers, Reb Zusha and Reb Elimelech. They were both Rebbes. Reb Elimelech was a Rebbe who was a big, strong, husky fellow. And Reb Zusha was a uh, diminutive kind of a fellow, very short and very weak and so on. They were both walking along the street. And all of a sudden, <coughs> there was a non-Jew who had a wagon full of hay. And as they were walking, as he was driving, the wagon hit something, turned over, and all the hay fell out. So, of course, whose fault is it? The two Jews. So he got out of the wagon. He started, you know, yelling at them. It's all your fault. Pick up the hay. Pick up the hay. So Rabbi Eli Melech went ahead and he started picking up the hay. Poor Rabbi Zusha was so weak, he couldn't lift up one of the bales of hay. They were heavy. So the guy said to him, so why aren't you picking up the hay? He said, well, I can't. So the guy said to him, it's not that you can't. You don't want to. And Rabbi Zusha started to cry. Turned to his brother. And he said, Rabbi Eli Melech, do you hear what this, Jew, this non-Jew is saying to me? Do you hear it? He said, the hay, the last hay of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's name, Yud, K, Vav, K, the last hay, which represents Kovach Shamayim in this world. It's on the floor. It's being trampled. Zusha, pick up the hay. And Zusha says, but I can't. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu is saying to him, but Zusha, you have to want to. If you want to, you'll be able to do it. He heard it. He heard the message. By the word, hey, is an English word. It's also a Yiddish word. And that's the hey, that's how they refer to the, the hey, is hey. And he said, the hey, the letter hey is on the floor. Zusha, why aren't you picking it up? There were two people, one who listened and one who didn't listen. Who didn't listen? A fellow by the name of Bilam. Bilam Arosha wants to curse Klai Yisrael. He gets on his donkey and he starts riding to curse Klai Yisrael. And what happens? The donkey stops. He hits him once, he hits him twice, he kicks him, he does what, all kinds. And then all of a sudden, the donkey starts talking to him. That's how it is. So what does he do? He proceeds to answer the donkey. Now let me ask you a question. If you're going on the 38, and there's a lots of traffic, right, these days, on the 38, and all of a sudden your car stops. Stark, like, like what happened now, Nebuch, poor guy, right? His car stopped, broken. So you go out, you pick up the hood, you kick the tires, you, I don't know, you look around, you putter, you listen, and nothing, and then all of a sudden your car starts to talk to you. Are you going to have a conversation with your car? What are you having a conversation with a donkey for, Billa? Don't you realize that Hashem is talking to you and saying, don't go? Oh, no. Uh, you're having a whole discussion, intellectual discussion, yeah, with a donkey. That was Billa. There was a man who did listen, and his name was Rabbi Akiva. You see, Rabbi Akiva, for the first 40 years of his life, he was an ignoramus. He didn't know an aleph in the bays. And then he had to go to learn with children, to learn Aleph base. And what made him turn to want to learn? So he's sitting by a brook, and he sees water dripping on a rock. He sees that it bores a beautiful symmetrical hole on, through the rock. It says Rabbi Akiva, if water, which is so soft, can have such an impression on, my, on a rock, imagine what Torah, which is like, Strong and powerful, it, what could it have on my, the impression it can make on my heart? And then Rabbi Akiva goes to study Torah. Now, can I ask you a question? That first itty bitty teeny weeny drop that fell on that rock the first time, many long time ago, did it leave an impression on the rock? No, you don't think so, huh? Well, my Rabbi Rabella Lapianzach and Tzadik Levracha used to say, of course, it had to have an impression. You know why? Because if the first drop did not have an impression, then the second drop would be a first drop. And first drops have no impression. You'd never get a hole. It had to have an impression. Maybe ever so slight. But that's what Rabbi Akiva was trying to teach us. 
Rabbi Akiva was trying to teach us, this man, Rabbi Akiva, who all of our Torah today stems from Rabbi Akiva. If it wouldn't be for Rabbi Akiva, we would all have no connection to Torah. Everything we have is coming from Rabbi Akiva. Because I'll say that when Moshe Rabbeinu came up to Shamayim and he saw Kodesh Baruch Hu writing crowns on the letters, he said, what, you, what was this? What is the crown? He says, oh, in years to come, there'll be a man who will be able to extract piles of halachos from those crowns. So he said, if that's the case, why are you giving Torah to me? Give the Torah to Rabbi Akiva. In Zohar it says that, Zohar HaKadosh says that Rabbi Akiva, when the HaKadosh Baruch Hu showed Adam Arishon, the, uh, all the generations and the leaders of those generations, he showed him Rabbi Akiva, he said, oh, finally one man who's a Tzuras Adam. He has the quality of the destiny of the world. This is the man. Rabbi Akiva reached the destiny of all mankind. He reached that ultimate destiny that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted for all of us. He reached it. He did it by observing a little bit of water on a rock without a talking donkey. He didn't need that. Let me share with you another story, if I may. I don't know if this story is true. I'm telling you right now from the beginning, but my daughter told me about it, and uh, she read it in the book. But it doesn't really matter. The message is clear. The story goes that there was a poetry contest in England. You realize that only in England can you have a poetry contest. Right? And uh, people from all over the country, and there were five finalists. These five finalists, they come to a big hall in London, and they're going to choose the best one of all of them, the winner. So they all read a poem. The poem that they had to read was the 23rd Psalm, which is Hashem Roi Lo Echso. God is my shepherd, I shall not lack anything. So they all read the poem, and of course there was this one fellow that stood out from all of them. They all clapped and gave him a round of applause that lasted for five minutes. His diction was magnificent. His, his, his words came out like music. And he was the clear winner. And everybody was happy. You know, fine. In the back of the room, there was a fella who started raising his hand and waving. So I have to first describe to you what he looked like. He had this big, round, black hat, a long, black coat, and a long, white beard. And he's waving his hand. So they, you know, the English, so they called on him. And they said, yes. And he says like this, I want to read the poem. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> I want to read the poem. So these guys, they didn't know what to do with this Jew. So they figured they're going to have some fun. So they bring him up. And he gets up on the stage and he starts reading Hashem roi lo yechsor. And by the time he finished the second sentence, everybody was crying. Everybody was crying. And the young fellow that won the uh, award that everybody clapped for goes over to this old Jew and he says to him, you know, by right, the, the, the prize is yours, not mine. Because when I read it, yeah, everybody applauded. But when you read it, everybody cried. What do you know that I don't know? And he said to him like this, young man, you read a poem about the shepherd. I know the shepherd. I live with the shepherd day in and day out. There's a difference between knowing about Hashem and hearing about Hashem and bringing him into your life and connecting to him. You see, we can go to shul. It's a wonderful thing. We can daven every day, three times a day, and do mitzvahs and put in our tefillin and learn Torah. But if we're not doing it in order to can make a connection to hear the call, if we're not doing it to hear what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants from us, if we're not doing it to connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, then we're, we're missing the entire essence of what it means to reach the destiny of a Jew. It's a total different way of life. Rashem is not just, it's something that your heart and your mind connects to, 
that you want to be connected with, and that he's real in your life. Know the shepherd, not just hear about him. I'll close with, with one last point. The Gemara wants to understand the uh, interpretation of this Pesach. Omer Rav Yehuda, Omer Rav, my dechsev, mi ho'i shechochem v'yovein ezos amaha of the ho'oretz. Who is this wise man who understands? Tell me, why was Eretz Yisrael destroyed? Why was there a churban? Why did we lose it? And the Gemara says this question was asked to the Chachamim, to the Nevi'im, to the Malachim. And they couldn't answer the question. Until HaKadosh Baruch Hu answers, Al ozva mes Torasi asher nosati lifnem. They forsook my Torah that I gave to them. Velo shomu bekoli velo holchubo. They didn't listen to my kol. Remember that kol. Velo holchubo. So the Omar asked, what's the difference? They didn't hear the voice and they didn't follow the words. It's the same thing. Answers the Gemara that when it says they didn't hear my voice, you know what it means? Shelo berchu batayra tchilo. They didn't make the birchas HaTorah. They didn't say birchas HaTorah. And that's why Eretz Yisrael was destroyed. That's why we lost the Beis HaMikdash, because they didn't make a bracha before they learned Torah. The Gemara itself said it was because of murder, Avodah Zorah, idol worship, Gilu Arayas, immorality. What is this Asher Lo So says the Maral, an amazing thing. Of course, the, the Eretz Yisrael and the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed because of these terrible Averis. But what brought them to do these Averis? How did they come to do these Averis? They came to do those Averis. Now that can't be that every one of us, we wake up in the morning, we make Birchas HaToyra. That's, that's part of the... You think these great people didn't say Birchas HaToyra? They were Tamid HaChachomim and Sadikim. Of course, they said the bracha. But when they said the bracha, there was one thing missing. They said the bracha, but they didn't use the bracha to attach themselves to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. When they said the bracha, something was missing. What was missing is to connect to him and bring him into your life in a real sense. Rabbi Akiva became Rabbi Akiva because he desired to have this connection to the truth, this connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, this connection to the Borei Olam. He listened to messages that every day, and we have it every day in our lives, every day, whatever is happening, we have a message from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So, if we're trying to prepare ourselves for the Yontif of Shavuos, for Kabbalah Satoira, for our encounter with HaKadosh Baruch Hu next Matzoi Shabbos, that night where we can accomplish the world, where we can achieve everything, if we want to prepare ourselves, we have to begin to look at the messages, hear the messages, and hear the call. The derech of Rabbi Akiva, after, you know, we, uh, we don't have anything other than Rabbi Akiva. What did Rabbi Akiva do? He looked at the rock, he looked at the water, he understood what was going on, finished, that's all it took. But he recognized that even the smallest, the smallest of energy, a little drop of water, can have an enormous effect as long as there's consistency. If it's drop after drop after drop after drop. Derech of Rabbi Akiva for Kabbalah Satara is our derech. <coughs> He's our guide. And in Mirz Hashem, if we pay attention to the messages, then we too will be zoicha to attain a bit of the light and the, and the Zohar and this ziv of Torah that will be communicated on the night of Shuas. It's with nonstop consistency that we too will be able to plug in to this Yom Tif and stand at Maimed Har Sinai. What we're doing is reenacting Maimed Har Sinai. And then perhaps, because we need it so desperately, and if we really want it, then Hashem will fulfill the prayer that we say every single day. Shabbos and every single Yom Tov, Kad Sheinu B'Mitzvosecho, V'Sein Chalkeinu B'Sorosecho. Give us our share, our place, our part in the Torah, so that we too, we too, can have the essence and the light and the beauty and the wonder of what Hashem gave to us 
by connecting to him through our study of Torah, through our performance of mitzvahs, and recognizing that we have no one else, nothing else. There's no question that that will lead us to the coming of Mashiach and to the rebuilding of the Beis HaMikdash where we'll all be able to come together be makabal pani Mashiach and dance separately, not together, but dance, dance with the simcha, with the joy of recognizing that we have finally come to our destiny, to our destination. Amen.